And also thank you to Brian and Nikki and everyone else at, uh, at IMEC uh, that's made uh, tonight's presentation possible. And apologies also for the technical difficulties in getting the presentation started. Uh, Zoom is a platform that's, uh, that, that's new to me, but uh, hopefully as we go through tonight's presentation, it'll become uh, more clear, certainly to myself. So tonight's presentation is the second in our series of um, approved CPD presentations. Um, in the presentation we delivered two weeks ago, it was the first presentation in the series, we looked at a very broad introduction to STEAM. We understand, we, or we moved to understand the fundamentals and the basic properties of STEAM, but also how and where STEAM is generated in the energy centre. So tonight we're going to move on to the next CPD presentation in the series. Um, I just want to remind those of you that are dialing in that may have missed the previous presentation a little bit about Spirax Sarco and who we are. We are a UK based global organisation with our headquarters down in Cheltenham. Um, but as far as the UK and Republic of Ireland team is concerned, about 50% of the team is actually based remotely on hand to support you, whatever your requirements may be, either on site or in your offices. But we've also got a number of different resources that are available. And um, just a reminder, uh, we did speak about them last week, but the resources that are available to you guys, whether you're designing STEAM systems or using STEAM on site, we've got a very, very powerful suite of calculators and configurators that are available both in desktop format on our website, but up in the top right hand corner of the screen, you can really see an example of the, um, uh, the little apps that are available for you to download onto your smartphone, whether it be an Android or an Apple free of charge app with a lot of very, very powerful calculators and configurators there that will be useful to you, whether you're designing a steam system, whether you want to calculate the cost of steam or condensate that can be recovered and thereby optimize your steam system to work it more efficiently but it can also help you to size certain key components such as the control valves the pressure reducing valves steam traps and even the steam and condensate pipe work itself so i'd encourage you to download that little app if you can the one thing i would say is please try and make sure you download the spirax Saco mexico app and not the uk and roi app there's a lot more functionality on the Mexican app, and you can also change the language back to English again. So moving on to the, uh, to, to the next slide, as you can see, the presentation we're going through tonight, it follows on from the first presentation in the series where we looked at STEAM fundamentals. And tonight we're going to look at the basic STEAM system design considerations. In other words, we're going to look at how we actually need to design the distribution network that conveys the steam from the point of generation to the point of use. And uh, just as a recap from uh, last week's presentation and from for the benefit of those of you that weren't e able to attend, I'm just going to go through a, a very few uh, quick slides just to remind ourselves of the basic principles of STEAM and how and why we need to treat it completely differently to any other source of energy such as low temperature hot water or thermal oils. So as we discussed last week, Steam is completely different to low temperature hot water or thermal oil. It's got different properties and those different properties bring us a certain number of advantages. For example, we know that steam's a gas and we know that by increasing the pressure that we generate that gas at, we know that we're reducing its volume. So for example, one kilogram of steam at a high pressure will have a very, very small volume but if we take one kilogram of steam at a much lower pressure, the mass will be exactly the same, but it will have a much, much greater volume. So if we can increase the pressure that we're generating and distributing that gas at, we can distribute that small volume in a very, very small, greatly reduced pipe size diameter. And we also know that because steam's a gas, then we don't actually need to pump that gas the steam will move from the point of generation in the boiler house and we can be distributing it 
hundreds, if not thousands of meters around sites, whether, whether we're a hospital, a food and beverage facility, or a pharmaceutical plant. The point where we want to actually use that steam can be a considerable distance from the point of generation. But because steam is a gas, it can move around the network in accordance with the pressure drop. So that's another benefit with generating steam at that high pressure. The steam can travel some considerable distance without us having to add any other motive energy to it. We don't need to pump it as we would do with an LTHW system. So of course, we've got a considerable capital cost saving by not having to purchase and install those pumps. But furthermore, we don't need to pay for any uh, additional energy to move that steam from the point of generation to the point of use. We also discussed that direct pressure to temperature relationship that there is with steam generation. If we know the pressure, then we know the temperature that the steam, that the water will boil and the steam will be produced at. And the advantage that that has is that it makes steam very, very easy to control at the process. If we only need the steam to exist at a certain temperature, then by reducing the pressure accordingly, we're actually controlling the temperature requirement. We'll come on and we'll discuss that in future weeks as we move through the presentation. We also know that steam has got far, far more heat energy contained within it than LTHW. Just look at that figure there. If we're comparing a kilogram of steam at, uh, uh, at zero bar gauge, to a kilogram of low temperature hot water, giving up 11 degrees at a heat exchanger. Well, we can see this 50 times more heat energy in that kilogram of steam. So of course, we need to generate and distribute far, far less steam to get the same heating effect. We also know steam as a gas. Well, it means that it gives up its heat energy and condenses evenly and equally across the entirety of the heat transfer surface area. We also know that steam as a gas, well, the speed of heat transfer, we, we also refer to that as the heat transfer coefficient. It can be three times greater than the speed of heat transfer on a water to water heat exchanger. So they're just some of the key advantages that we have by using steam for heat exchange, as opposed to using any other source of heat energy. And that information's got its basis in the understanding that water, which is the key ingredient of a steam system, has got a specific heat capacity of 4.19. That means if we want to increase a kilogram of water by one degree in temperature, we've got to add 4.19 kilojoules of energy to it. So what we can see on the screen at the moment, if we look up towards the, the, the top left of the screen, you can see what we call the steam tables. Let's take the example of zero bar gauge atmospheric conditions. If we want to bring one kilogram of water up to a temperature of 100 degrees, which as we know, atmospheric conditions is boiling point, then we need to add 419 kilojoules of energy to that water to make it boil. But we're talking about steam systems here. We don't want boiling water. We need that water to fully evaporate and change state so that kilogram of water has now become a kilogram of gas of steam. In order to make that water evaporate, we've got to add a further 2,257 kilojoules of energy into it. So once the water's evaporated, we've got steam. At zero bar gauge, at the very, very far right side of the table, you can see the volume that that kilogram of steam would exist at, at zero bar gauge, 1.673 cubic meters. And the next column to the right, that tells us the total energy that will be present in the steam at that pressure, 2,676 kilojoules. That's the total heat energy. And that's comprised of the water, the energy we need to add to the water to make it boil, we can call that the enthalpy of evaporation or the sensible heat, sorry, the enthalpy of water or the sensible heat. And then also it's the energy that we added to that boiling water to make it change state. 
we can call that the enthalpy of evaporation or the latent heat. But when steam gives up its heat energy at the process, it condenses. It changes state from a gas to a liquid. We can't use that condensate for heat exchange purposes. It, it's got no value in it. But when steam condenses, it's actually the enthalpy of evaporation that's shown in that middle column, highlighted in green in the case of zero bar gauge. That's the useful heat energy that enters the process. That means what's held back in that liquid condensate in the case of zero bar gauge is 419 kilojoules of energy per kilogram. It's hot water, but it's got no value to us at the process. We need to get it away very quickly. So the steam tables are very, very useful because they give us a lot of powerful information very quickly. It tells us the temperature that water boils at if we know the pressure. And consequently, it tells us that if we know the boiling point of water, we also know the temperature that the steam will exist at, at that pressure. It tells us how much energy we need to put into the water to make it change state and produce steam. It tells us how much energy will exist in the steam, and it tells us the volume that that mass of steam will occupy if we know the pressure. It can be a little bit confusing, and that, that's why we encourage you to download that little app, because it will make sense of that information very quickly. And last week, we also spoke about the temperature to enthalpy curve that you can see over towards the right-hand side of the screen. And that shows us the journey that water takes as it reaches boiling point and evaporates and becomes steam. And on the example that you can see on the screen here, we're looking at a pressure of zero bar gauge where we know the boiling point is 100 degrees. So if we move across horizontally from 100 degrees, you can see when we've added 419 kilojoules of energy to that water, it will start to boil and that's when the evaporation process will begin. But it's only when we've added the 2,257 kilojoules of energy into that water that the evaporation process will end. And that's when we can say we've got a mass of dry saturated steam. So the term dry saturated is critically important. Saturated, it means the steam is saturated with energy. We know when it's 100% dry, it can contain 2,676 kilojoules of energy and no more. But the problem is, if there was something amiss with our client's combustion process, as we discussed uh, two weeks ago when we had the first CPD presentation in our series, if our client wasn't putting the, the, the full and expected amount of energy into the combustion burner, they'd be producing steam that was likely to be wet the steam would sit, the energy point of the steam would sit slightly to the, to the left of the, um, of, the, of the curve, of the dry saturated steam curve that we can see. And we're gonna have a number of problems with wet steam. First of all, if we're generating steam that is excessively wet, then if we're distributing that steam in oversized steel pipe work, some considerable distance, then it's highly likely that a certain mass of that steam is going to condense and give up its energy to the pipework, even before it gets to the process. So if we've got a heat exchanger that is expecting 9,800 kilograms of steam per hour, but if we're generating 10,000 kilograms of steam per hour, but, but losing 400 kilograms of steam as it condenses in the distribution pipework, then this simply isn't going to be enough steam available to satisfy the requirements of the process. The process time is going to extend and extend, or it could well be that we fail to hit the set temperature altogether. And if we're distributing wet steam with more condensate in the distribution pipe work, we've got to install a greater number of steam traps to remove that condensate. Remember, there's nowhere near as much energy in that condensate as there is in the steam. We need to get the condensate away. It also means that if we fail to remove that condensate, 
it's likely that the condensate will be will be held back in the distribution pipe work and that can create a little bit of corrosion of the steam pipe work itself meaning we can get rust entrained within the steam itself it also means that we can corrode vital components such as steam traps but if we're moving steam at a particularly fast velocity that fast moving steam as a gas can pick up those small flecks and droplets of liquid condensate and if we're moving that steam that has now become progressively wetter and wetter with that entrained moisture as it passes across sensitive areas such as um, control valves pressure reducing valves flow meters if that wet steam is moving at some velocity, it can create quite a lot of erosion or abrasion of those delicate surfaces, meaning not only are we going to be routinely maintaining that solution, but in the case of flow meters and control valves, there's likely to be an inefficiency because we're not going to be able to control the steam or measure the steam as efficiently as we would have hoped. But we also know that if we get a fluctuation of steam pressure in the distribution pipe work, that condensate can be drawn up into a solid slug, a solid mass. And if we get a buildup of steam pressure behind that solid mass, it can be thrown with a lot of violence and create a, a knocking, banging, vibration effect of the distribution pipe work. We refer to that as water hammer and that needs to be taken seriously from a health and safety perspective. But of course, if we've got excessively wet steam, remember, we're going to have far, far less energy present in that steam than the process is expecting. So not only are we going to have a reduced mass of steam finding its way to the process, there's going to be less energy contained within the steam that does find its way to the process. The process time is likely to extend and extend. We're going to have a huge energy inefficiency, but of course we've got the mechanical defects caused by that erosion, corrosion and water hammer that we've spoken about. So for that reason, one of the biggest enemies of a, of a well-designed steam distribution network should be considered as being wet steam. And we spoke about the boiler house in some detail uh, last week because we know that if we're not generating steam efficiently or correctly in the energy center, we're never going to have a good condition of steam that enters the wider distribution network. And you'll remember we spoke last week about one of the most important, one of the key components being the atmospheric feed tank or the hot well itself. So we can't use condensate for heat transfer purposes. There simply isn't enough energy in the condensate. But the one area where we can make good use of that liquid condensate is by recovering it back to the hot well. That's where we keep the water. So it's held there at a nice high temperature on demand whenever the boiler is calling for more and more water to produce steam. So the benefits of keeping the hot well at a nice high temperature, if you remember, are first of all, hot water going into the boiler. It means the boiler is going to respond and produce steam more rapidly. If we're putting hot water into the boiler, of course, it means we need to consume less fuel to generate steam. It means there's going to be less thermal fatigue of the boiler. It's going to be far, far kinder to the boiler if we're putting hot water into it rather than cold water. But it also means that we need to consume far, far fewer boiler chemicals, typically sodium sulfite, to polish off and scour off the last remaining oxygen and non-condensable gas particles. Now, the reason we put those chemicals into the hot well to remove the oxygen and the non-condensables is when we're talking about the boiler itself, Oxygen can create a lot of pitting and corrosion and oxygen should be considered as perhaps the biggest enemy for the steam boiler itself. The higher the temperature we can keep the feed water at, the better the condition of steam, the more responsive the boiler, the less maintenance and wear and tear we can expect. And we also spoke about the uh, boiler level controls as well last, uh, last time we spoke. Uh, we, we presented. You'll remember that the level controls can be um, a, a very low level of sophistication such as a, tip, a basic magnetic float type 
or there can be a sophisticated level control, such as a capacitance or a conductivity probe. And if we move towards one of the more sophisticated probes, then that can send a signal to um, a modulating pump as opposed to an on-off pump. The benefit of doing that is think of, uh, think of it as boiling a pan of pasta at home on your hob. If we suddenly get um, a pint of cold water and pour that into the pan, the boiling rate will stop. We've got to put more energy into that pan before the boiling will start again. And that really demonstrates the, 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 the drawbacks of an on-off pump. But alternatively, if we got a kettle of boiling water and we just dripped in a very, very small amount of high temperature near to boiling water periodically in equilibrium with the steaming production rate, then we get a consistently better condition of steam. It would be drier for one, but it also means we'd consume far, far less energy in order to do so. So there are benefits in upgrading the level controls and there are benefits in upgrading those feed pumps from on off to modulating. But of course, the boiler industry is a very, very competitive environment. So unless the client or the design engineer specifically specifies uh, the more sophisticated grade of controls, it's highly likely that the more basic control will be installed. All of that can have an impact on the steam quality. And we also spoke about the, uh, the TDS uh, and also the bottom below down. What you may recall from the last time we presented was the chemicals and minerals that are present in the raw water. Together with the chemicals and minerals that we, we then treat the water with, they're going to behave in two different ways. Now, some of those chemicals, they're going to solidify and gather as a sediment at the bottom of the boiler. And they need to be removed periodically across a bottom blowdown valve. If we don't do that, then we're in danger that that sediment can build up over time and it can create um, a problem by blocking the, the, the fire tubes running horizontally throughout the shell of the boiler itself. So we need to perform blowdown. We need to purge a certain mass of water to waste to flush that sediment away. But any more, than the pre any more than the prescribed mass of blowdown is going to represent a significant inefficiency from an energy perspective. And it also means we're then encountering the problem by having to replace that hot water with a similar mass of cold water. And of course, there can then be a delay or a lag until such a time that the boiler can recover and start producing steam. Then we've got to also perform the TDS blowdown. TDS standing for a total dissolved solids. And that's because a certain amount of the chemicals and minerals will never solidify. They'll be held in solution. And what you may recall is that if that concentration of chemicals reaches a dangerously high point, then that's when we get a, an excessive mass of foaming present within the boiler. So even the slightest fluctuation in boiler pressure means that that foam can be drawn out of the boiler. It's going to be very wet, sticky uh, foam. It's going to drag some of the energy down out of the steam, resulting in that wet steam we spoke about. And as the foam dries out and changes state to a chalky scale, it can be carried at some speed around the network, contributing to some of that erosion of sensitive areas that we spoke about, but it, but it can also block heat transfer surface areas, resulting in an inefficiency and a slowdown of heat transfer. So we need to perform TDS blowdown in exactly the same manner that we do with the bottom blowdown. The only difference is we take that from the side of the boiler. And as with the bottom blowdown, we can move away from a manual valve and we can automate it to ensure that not only do we get the best possible condition of steam being produced, leaving the boiler house, but it also means that we can ensure that we're not blowing down any more than the prescribed amount of blowdown that needs to go to waste. So, as we've mentioned last week, um, Steam operators, processors that are using steam, they've got the health and safety guidance documents that they can refer to. 
Uh, the key word being guidance. So there's no obligation for anybody to observe uh, the, the guidance documents, but as with all things, if there were to be a severe failure of a boiler or a health and safety incident, there'd be questions to, to be asked at a higher level if it was found that that guidance had not been followed. And the other thing to bear in mind is the health and safety executive, they, they don't care about the quality of steam that's being produced. They don't care whether the, the steam is wet and causing inefficiency problems or whether it's causing problems at the process and they don't care whether the steam is of a poor condition and causing um, erosion corrosion and water hammer problems all they care about is that the steam is being produced safely in the boiler house and again that is one of the reasons why there are so many different types of sophisticated and levels of sophistication with the controls on the boiler itself so you can appreciate that if we've put a lot of time and effort into generating steam as efficiently as we can and producing steam at the best possible quality, then we want to ensure that if that steam is then leaving the boiler house and being distributed hundreds, if not thousands of meters around site, we want to ensure that we're observing good working practice so that the steam can get to the point of use in the best possible condition. So the steam distribution network, basically it, it, the name suggests um, that we need to give thought to how we're conveying that steam from the point of generation to the point of use. And when we're talking about a good quality steam in the distribution line itself, it typically means that we want the steam to be as dry as possible. In other words, we want to remove any entrained moisture that may exist within the steam if we're generating wet steam, but any steam that does condense out in the distribution pipe work and change the state to condensate, it needs to be removed very, very quickly. It also means that we need to get rid of as much air and other non-condensable gases as we possibly can. So the water treatment that takes place in the hot well, that's to ensure that we're getting rid of any oxygen within the boiler. So we're not causing corrosion and oxygen pitting within the boiler itself. But when we talk about the distribution network, it, it's nigh on impossible to guarantee that we can prevent air from existing. Because when we turn the steam boiler off, the steam condenses, it pulls a vacuum. We can be drawing air in from the outside through vacuum breakers and gaskets and so forth. All we can do is ensure that the air can be vented away once the steam system becomes pressurized again. And I'll come on and explain why that is in a few slides time. But perhaps one of the most important things that we need to give consideration to is ensuring that those steam pipes have been sized correctly. Remember, steam's a gas, it moves around the network in accordance with the pressure drop method. So the benefits of generating steam at a high pressure are, are, are quite self-explanatory, really. The steam tables tell us that at a higher pressure, that mass of steam will occupy a very, very small volume because we've compressed it. Whereas at a lower pressure, it's going to exist at a, a greater volume. And therefore, the infrastructure is going to be far, far more costly, especially if we're distributing that steam thousands of meters. But we also know we've got another capital cost benefit that's often overlooked, and that's because if we've reduced the volume of the steam and therefore reduced the heat transfer surface area that the steam could condense at, we've reduced the heat losses. There's less condensate given up to the pipework, another, another efficiency cost saving. And therefore, we need to install far, far fewer steam traps because there's less condensate to remove another cost saving. There's less steam traps to maintain and inspect, another cost saving. Also means that we need to give thought to other cost savings such as reduced insulation, reduced bracketry side sizes and so forth and so forth. But it means that the steam is going to find its way to the process at a much better condition, far, far drier, less en uh, more energy contained within it, and therefore the process will take on the heat energy more rapidly, more efficiently. 
So there's a methodology to employ with regards to ensuring we're sizing the steam pipes correctly. We've got the pressure drop method. We've got the velocity method. Both of these methods um, can be calculated for you at the same time on that little app that we've spoken about. But particularly with regards to the velocity method, it's the condition of the steam, how dry the steam is that's critically important. For example, if we've looked in the boiler house and we know that the controls on the boiler are not particularly sophisticated, there's an expectation that the steam is going to be wet from time to time. And we don't want to be conveying that wet steam at a fast velocity because that means that we're more likely to be exposing ourselves to the erosion of those sensitive areas that we spoke about. So a rule of thumb is if we've got wet steam, we want to move it at a gentle velocity but if we know as for a fact we've got an excellent condition of steam, then we could decide that we want to move it at a slightly faster velocity, thereby enabling us to reduce the pipe size slightly. But again, steam's a gas, it's not a liquid. So we need to observe the correct and good working practice to ensure that we're not trapping the condensate and that that condensate can move freely and easily to a low point where it can be drained away very, very quickly. So for example, you'll see um, the correct installation of a steam trapping station where we can separate the condensate from the steam. And you'll see the correct orientation of a Y type strainer. And on a steam system, we want to rotate the basket so it's lying horizontally and not hanging vertically down because that means that we're not trapping that condensate there, at which point it wouldn't be able to escape. And if we did have a fluctuation in pressure in the steam pipe, we'd be exposing ourselves to that erosion, corrosion and water hammer. Again, all the good work in practice. We want to ensure that there's a, a rise and fall in the steam distribution pipe work itself, kind of like a sawtooth effect. And that needs to be in the direction of steam flow to ensure that we're aiding the condensate to drain away to the steam trapping stations that should be located somewhere between every 30 and 50 meters apart to help us drain the condensate away and keep the steam as dry as possible. And on that theme, we also want to ensure that any takeoff pipe work is removing the steam from the top, top of the distribution line, not the side, definitely not the bottom, as that's where the condensate exists. And that's where we'd be uh, taking wet steam towards the process and causing the, the process time to extend and extend. So we also spoke about the importance of air venting of the distribution pipe work. And that's for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it means that any steam that condenses in the distribution pipe work, it means we're at risk of a little bit of the air and other non-condensable gases becoming reabsorbed back into that liquid condensate. And an excess of air would mean that that condensate over time would become more and more acidic. It turned to carbonic acid. And that's what partly causes the corrosion, not just of the steam pipe work, but also on, the, on, also on the, the wet side, on the condensate side as well. And as we get that acidic condensate back to the boiler house, back to the hot well, we've got to add in more and more conditioning chemicals, not only at some cost, but also meaning that that's going to affect the, the TDS and the bottom blowdown as well. But as you can see in the middle of the screen, um, the, perhaps the biggest problem caused by a surplus of air and other non-condensable gases entrained within the steam, it means we're going to get an insulating effect as that pocket of air becomes trapped at the process. And that means we can now no longer rely on that pressure to temperature relationship. It's got its, it's, got its principles in Dalton's, law, Dalton's laws of partial pressures. So we need to use a thermostatic air vent. Not a mechanical air vent, because that works on the density principle. And of course, steam and air have got very, very similar densities, but they've got different temperatures. So if we can use a thermostatic air vent at the occasional high point and at the process and at the very, very end of a distribution line, it means we can allow that cold air to be pushed across the thermostatic vent by the high pressure steam. And once that high temperature steams hit the thermostatic capsule, 
it can expand and that valuable steam can be locked in whilst allowing the air to be vented away. Other good working practice um, is to observe safe isolation wherever possible. Whenever we need to isolate a process or some capital equipment for maintenance purposes, we want to ensure that we're observing good working practice with safe isolation wherever possible. So the reason being is that steam is obviously a high temperature, high pressure media. And as such, steam valves are typically metal to metal seated. And that means that even the slightest amount of moisture or rust or other particulate in the steam is at risk of causing erosion of those sensitive areas. So if we lock that valve shut, we could still get passage of steam and that can cause a health and safety event. So a number of years ago, clients quite rightly identified that they could move towards what we call a uh, double block and bleed configuration. As you can see in the little screen towards the, the top right hand side of the, the screen. And that demonstrates how if we've got one primary valve that we're passing, a secondary valve could lock any passing steam dead tight. And if we had a little third bleed valve coming off at a T, then that could vent away any of that leaking steam because steam moves on the pressure drop it moves towards the path of least resistance and that can give a little telltale sign that um, the operator is working on the plant safely but also that that first leaking valve needs a little bit of attention and that's great that works really well but if a client's wanting to upgrade from a single isolation valve to that double block and bleed configuration they may not always have the space in the plant room to do that they may not be able to justify the, the pipe work modification or the downtime to be able to do that. But the good news is that clients can move towards what's referred to as a, a, a safe isolation valve shown in the main picture here. And that really demonstrates how all three of those valves can be brought together in the same face-to-face -face that occupied the single previous isolation valve. So it's a valve in, valve out. You can upgrade the health and safety very, very quickly there. Installation's also something that's critically important to give thought to on the distribution network. First reason, from a health and safety perspective. If we've got high pressure steam, we've got steam that exists at a very high temperature. We don't want to be falling or banging our head or putting our hand against a, a high temperature steel pipe. We're going to get burned. But of course, if we're conveying a high temperature, high pressure gas in a steel pipe, some considerable distance on a very cold day, could be an oversized pipe, it could be passing outdoors. We're gonna get a considerable amount of heat loss. So if we can improve the grade of insulation significantly, we're going to be reducing that heat loss. We're gonna be improving the overall efficiency from an energy perspective. We're going to be reducing the amount of steam traps we need to install and maintain because there's going to be less condensate. And we're going to end up with steam that is drier with more heat energy contained within it. And we're going to end up with steam that is drier and therefore likely to cause fewer issues concerned with erosion, corrosion and water hammer. So as we've mentioned, we distribute steam at a high pressure and therefore at a high temperature. We distribute it in steel pipe work and we can, can be distributing it some considerable distance as well. So it's inevitable that there's going to be a certain amount of expansion imparted to the infrastructure. So we can help to give you some guidance with regards to how much expansion you can expect. If we know a few key parameters such as the pipe size, the run of pipe work, pressures, the temperatures, the ambient conditions, the, the mass flow rate. And from then on, we can understand how much expansion is likely to be expected. We can give guidance with regards to how you can mitigate against that expansion and also where the various anchor points can be. Now, if we're starting a steam system up from cold too rapidly, a steam system should be warmed up very, very slowly, very gradually. But if we get a, a, a plant operator that may be a little bit heavy handed and they may warm the steam system up too quickly, then the two risks there are that first of all, 
more of the steam will condense in the distribution pipe work. So we'll get a greater condensate load. We'll get more inefficiency and a greater risk of that erosion, corrosion and water hammer that we spoke about. But it also means that as more energy is imparted to the pipe work, we expect far, far more expansion of the infrastructure. So we need to ensure that the steam system is, is brought up in accordance with the, uh, the guidance documents that will exist in the boiler house. And we also need to give thought to the pipe supports. Now, we've mentioned that steam's a gas, so it's far, far lighter in weight than low temperature hot water. So we may not need quite as many support centers on a steam distribution network as we would do with, um, with LTHW, but we don't want to avoid having too fewer supports because if we do, we're at risk that the pipe can sag. And if that pipe work sags, again, that's when we're at risk of that erosion, corrosion, water hammer. That's when we're at risk of getting steam that becomes progressively wetter. And that's when we're at risk of having um, a poor condition of steam that can impact problems upon the process. So far better if we can even move towards a system where we could support the pipe work from below, maybe using a roller and chair configuration. At least that way, we're able to assist with the expansion and the movement of the steam pipe work as well. So we've mentioned that one of the first things we want to do in order to keep the steam at the best possible condition is to dry it. And we dry the steam using a steam separator. Basically, it separates any moisture that's entrained within that wet steam. Typically, wet steam enters the separator. It passes across a number of baffles. The moisture becomes impinged within on those baffles and condenses very, very quickly. That condensate is taken away from the bottom of the separator across a steam trap where it can be re returned back to the boiler house. And then we've got dry steam that leaves the separator and it passes towards the process. But before it does so, it passes across a little Y-type strainer. And that little Y-type strainer that you can see downstream of the, the first isolation valve, it's difficult to spot because it's actually installed correctly with its leg on its side and not pointing vertically down. So as that, as that steam leaves the Y-type strainer, it's now had the vast majority of its moisture removed. It's now had a lot of its particulate removed. So it's in an excellent condition for passing across a pressure reducing valve or a control valve. We're not exposing ourselves to the risk of that erosion. And it also means if we're getting dry steam passing onto the process, there's far, far more energy present within the steam. Now, the thing to look out for here is that um, conditioning ancillaries such as separators and strainers, they're very, very often overlooked. They can be value engineered out or they may be just left off the design altogether, but they perform a critical function in ensuring that we get a rapid and efficient release of heat energy by keeping the heat content of the steam as high as possible. But they protect those pressure reducing valves, control valves and flow meters from any excessive wear and tear. And then the first thing we want to do as the steam moves towards the process is we want to drop the pressure of the steam down. Remember, we've got the benefits of generating and distributing steam at a high pressure, but we want to consume the steam at a low pressure because we've got that pressure to temperature relationship. So for example, if we're distributing steam at 10 bar gauge, 184 degrees, the process may actually only require steam at at um, 165 degrees, which is six bar gauge. By reducing the pressure, we're controlling the temperature. So we can use um, a pressure reducing valve. It can be a, a bellows sealed, a direct acting, or a pilot operated uh, pressure reducing valve. They all work on different processes in slightly different ways. But the vast majority of processes will also require a safety valve. The purpose of the safety valve is to protect against an overpressure, which could cause a, a serious problem with either the, the capital equipment or any process of operators' health and safety. 
So the safety valve is there in the event that that pressure reducing valve or control valve may fail. And with regards to pressure safety valves, there's a correct installation to observe. For one, we never isolate ahead of the safety valve for obvious reasons. We want the spindle mounting in the vertical. And just as an isolation valve is going to be metal to metal seated, well, safety valves are metal to metal seated. So it's inevitable to expect there could be a little bit of steam weeping across those seats. We need to allow that steam that is going to condense in the pipework to drain away. And we also need to ensure that the relieving pipework downstream of the safety valve is kept as short as it possibly can be. So we're not putting an excessive back pressure on the safety valve. Could well be that we're moving towards a control valve as an alternative to the pressure reducing valve. And a control valve, it can either be electrically or pneumatically actuated typical rule of thumb is pneumatic control valves work very, very rapidly and they give a very tight shut off against a high operating pressure. Whereas the electrically actuated control valves, they work with a greater degree of accuracy. The important thing to, well, the two important things to consider with control valves are, first of all, we need to observe those conditioning ancillaries, the separator and the Y type strainer to protect it from that wear and tear. And the other thing to bear in mind with a control valve is we need to ensure that it's correctly sized. We always size a control valve in accordance with the mass flow requirement of the process. Um, never on the upstream line size. For example, if we've got an inch and a half steam pipe, it may well be that we size the control valve to be one inch. If we see a control valve that is line sized, then alarm bells should be ringing because that tells us that that control valve is likely to be spending a significant amount of time operating very, very close to its seats. And if that happens, that means that we've got steam exiting the control valve at a very, very fast velocity. In some cases, 400, 450 meters per second. So you can appreciate even the smallest amount of moisture present in that steam can create a, 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 a significant erosive effect. So not only would we be called upon to maintain that control valve excessively, it means that we'd be getting a very, very erratic control of the steam at the process. And again, on the subject of conditioning ancillaries, we want to ensure that whenever we stall, uh, installing a steam meter, a flow meter used on steam, we need to condition the steam. We need to keep the steam as dry as possible and we need to remove the air and the non-condensable gases because if we've got excessively wet steam with a lot of air in it, that pressure temperature relationship and also the pressure volume relationship can no longer be, re be relied on. We can only accurately meet a steam if we've got dry, saturated steam. And of course, we want to remove the moisture and any other entrained particles to ensure that we're protecting the meter against um, excessive abrasion. So please don't consider a, a meter as a, a dedicated fit and forget solution. We need to ensure that we've got all the correct ancillaries to condition the steam so that we get an accurate and reliable reading. So once we get the steam um, to the process, then uh, obviously that's where we want to use the steam. And the purpose of the distribution network is to ensure that the steam is moved from the point of generation to the point of use in the best possible, con so that we get the steam at the process in the best possible condition so that we're distributing steam efficiently from an energy perspective, but perhaps most importantly, we're distributing that steam safely. And when we get the steam to the process, we want it to be in the best possible condition. And there are a certain number of processes that may call for steam to exist at a certain condition or quality. That's likely to be where we're using steam for direct injection purposes, where that steam could be exposed to an atmosphere or a product. And this is common in the food, beverage, pharmaceutical and healthcare sectors. And they're going to refer to the condition of the steam using a methodology 
we refer to as BSEN285. And they're going to call for the steam to exist at a dryness of 95% or better. That way we know how much energy there is in the steam. They're going to want the steam to be free of air and other non-condensable gases, typically 3.5% by volume of the condensate. And um, that means that we can rely on that pressure temperature relationship. And of course, if we're using steam for direct injection purposes into a sterilizer, or an oven, an autoclave, a clean room, we're going to need to ensure that that steam is free of particulate, moisture, scale, rust, anything else that may be present in the boiler or the distribution network. And also that the steam can enter the process at the correct mass flow, pressures and temperatures. We're going to come on and we're going to talk a little bit about more about that as we move through the future series of CPD presentations that we have diarized. So of course, processes where steam are typically used, they vary considerably. They can either be closed loop heat exchangers, plate heat exchangers, calorifiers, air handling units, or they can be used for direct injection purposes. And when we speak next, on the 16th of December, we're going to talk more about the uses of steam in heat exchange processes. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time uh, uh, so far. And I'd just like to summarize before we, uh, before we close for this evening. We've discussed that steam's got a lot of heat energy, meaning it's very, very attractive for so many different heat transfer applications. And we've mentioned how it's easy to distribute it because we don't require those pumps. We distribute it under pressure. And we've mentioned how we can use a very, very simple two port pressure reducing valve to break down the heat energy very, very easily. We've mentioned how it's critical to ensure that we generate steam in the boil house correctly. If we don't generate steam correctly, we're exposing ourselves to a number of issues, not just at the process, but in the wider steam distribution network. But even if we are generating an excellent condition of steam, we still need to observe that good working practice to ensure that it doesn't degrade as it travels around the loop. Treat steam as a gas, Forget about the good working practice that you may have learned to observe on a, a liquid-based system. And we want to consider the two main enemies of steam as being steam that is excessively wet and steam that is free of air and other non-condensable gases. So everything we do to design the steam distribution network should really be built around minimizing wet steam and maximizing the opportunity for air to be vented away to atmosphere. So um, that concludes the second of the suite of seven different CPD presentations as we've mentioned. We will move on and discuss uh, the uses of steam for heat exchange purposes when we, uh, when we meet again on the 16th of December. So uh, please feel free to click through to the IMEC uh, website and register for the, 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 the coming CPD presentations in the series. Um, I'm more than happy to supply you with a PDF of the slide pack that we've gone through today and an attendance certificate, but I don't have, I'm not party to your um, contact details. So if that is something that would be useful, please either send me a message on LinkedIn, send me an email, and I'll, uh, I'll do everything I can to provide you with that information over the coming days. So with that in mind, I'd just like to thank you very much for your time, for joining us this evening. And if you do have any questions, then uh, like I said, please either submit them over the chat function now, or please feel free to email me at any point in the coming, uh, coming days and weeks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, brilliant as usual. Um, I've got our first questions come in. Um, is it acceptable for a control valve to be passing slightly? Uh, is it something that can uh, develop over time uh, or down to poor design? Uh, it could be down to a number of different factors. It could be, it could be oversized. It could be, if, if, a, if a control valve is oversized, it will operate very close to its seat for a, a prolonged period of time. And that's when we're exposing ourselves to um, erosion. Um, erosion, not only is it a, a nuisance because it means it will, the control valve will require 
uh, excessive repair and maintenance. It means there's an energy inefficiency there because we're passing steam onto the process that simply isn't required. And of course, it means that if we've got unwanted energy going onto the process, we, we could have product spoilage. So it could be a design issue. It could be down to the fact that we've um, simply failed to install the correct conditioning ancillaries that separate to that strainer that we've we've spoken about. Or it could well be that the um, the control valve has been incorrectly specified. If it's in a particularly aggressive environment, it may need uh, it, it may be more suited to a, a soft seat or a, a different trim. The good news is that um, the vast majority of control valve manufacturers, um, ourselves included, um, can have a, a cage inside the control valve that can be very, very easily changed out and retrofitted in line in situ, minimum, minimum, minimizing the downtime. 